When I use the words entity resolution, I mean this, recognizing when two entities are the same, despite having been described differently. There's a lot of differences between these two records. I also mean this, uh, recognizing when two entities don't relate to the same entity, despite having so much similarity. This third record to the second only has one letter that's different. And then remembering the relationships between these entities. That's what I mean by entity resolution. The first sophisticated entity resolution engine I built was for the Las Vegas gaming industry. We built this in 1993. We took all these data sources in the green, which are like good guys, and we took 18 different data sets that are would be considered like the bad guys, and we entity resolved them to figure out who is who and who is related to who to find things like which of their gamblers were, richly, were actually known cheaters, and as well figure out when employees had relationships to vendors or bad guys. After we built this system in 93, in 1996, we built a system for a billion records, 4,200 data sources to entity resolve 100 million people. Then we built another entity resolution engine, then my team and I built another, and eventually we sold this, this line of entity resolution to IBM in 2005. They've renamed it to Identity Insight. It's a great product. I consider it my oldest daughter. I stayed at IBM in 11 and a half years. I was the longest CEO founder to ever stay. And a few years in, four years in, I dreamt up this idea. I decided to codename it G2. And I went and pitched the leadership at IBM. And I said, I want to build this. I want to start over. I want to build some software to do entity resolution that does it in real time. No training, no tuning, no experts. Self-tuning, self-correcting. Um, vertically and horizontally scalable, you can feed it billions of records and then do thousands of transactions a second. You can uh, add new data sources, new types of entities, new types of attributes while the plane's in the air, and bake more privacy features in than any analytics in this class that I've ever worked on. They said, how much? I thought about it. I said, 50 million. They said, can you start with five people? I said, sure. So we started in 2009, we spent a year on the schema, we spent then another year and a half actually coding, and we started shipping in 2012. Uh, this project my team and I are quite proud of, but it's helping um, modernize voter registration in America, 350 million records, maybe four terabytes of data. Uh, this entire system is run by one person. The same software running on a laptop gets used by the government of Columbia to find, uh, what is that, 600,000 fake students and save 300 million and help the Singaporeans and to resolve people, companies, and vessels looking for vessels in the Malacca Straits that might be of some risk so they can send folks with guns and masks to come and visit. What I'm going to do next, I've spent 30 hours on these next 10 charts. I call it entity resolution in slow motion. It's going to show you how it thinks. Now, what I want you to do is take a look at these three records and tell me whether you think they're one person, two, or three. Now, if you look at records one and three, the name, the address, and the phone, you will find to be similar. And if you compare records one and two, you'll see that the name, phone, and the, and the date of birth are similar, although the date of birth has a month and day transposed. And so this would be an example of fuzzy matching. Here comes another record. Often, email address is a pretty good way to bind two records. But not if the names are different. Some people, some families, share email addresses. So in this case, we would call this a discovered relationship. And while I'm on relationships, I'll just show you a disclosed relationship. When they onboard the account, say at the bank, they tell you who their spouse is, this would be a disclosed relationship. Now it's going to get a little more sophisticated. Take a look at this record. What do you think happens to this? I'm going to give you, there's really two choices, um, or three. It's either the same as entity one, or it's possibly the same. You can't be totally sure or it would be just some relationship to something, but no chance of being the same. In this case, we would consider this a fuzzy match because name and date of birth really aren't enough features to put two people together. This one here we've struggled with for years. Only recently did we figure out how to solve it at scale. Uh, what would you do with this record? It shares the email address from one and four. You know, now, now imagine this, what if this record came with a piece of information that said, shoot on site? I mean, you don't want to arbitrarily give this to record one or four. And what if this record had the word street on it, so it was a little bit more like record one? As if Patricia, record four, didn't live on a street. 
we used to arbitrarily bind this to one or the other. And what we do now is we keep it out, and we call it ambiguous. If entity E1 didn't exist, you could be pr very sure at that moment it was E2. And if E2 didn't exist, you could be sure it was E1. But in the evidence of both, you have to pull it out. We have a famous boxer, uh, George Foreman. He named all five of his boys George. That's this problem. OK, record eight. When this record shows up, it's quite a bit like entity E1. It's going to land inside of E1, and then something else is going to happen. Anybody want to take a guess what else one might learn? If you learned that entity E1 had the email address B Smith at work, I think somebody whispered it. But the moment 8 lands in E1, you can change your mind about the past and pull in uh, record 6. Now, this next move has also been very difficult. We spent probably a year doing this to do this at scale, is record 9. Record 9 is a lot like record 3, same name, same passport, but a different date of birth than record 1 and 2. So I'm going to tell you it's going to appear to the right of E1, uh, record 9. It'll be a new entity, but something else is going to happen. It's going to change its mind about the past again. Anybody want to take a guess what else would happen? 3 pops out and the relationship moved over. This is hard. Having this new piece of data, you've learned something. Imagine this, you've loaded a billion records, you've made a billion assertions, and now you get record billion and one. You have to ask yourself, is it a new person or a known person? And now that I know this, had I known this in the beginning, over the billions of decisions or assertions I've made, should I have made any of them differently? Doing that in real time is extremely uh, difficult to do at scale. This next one is fundamentally the most important for catching clever bad people. Take a look at 10 and figure out where it belongs. Now, what most people do is record matching. You're comparing it to record one and going, nope, not enough info. What about comparing it to record two? Nope, not enough info. And what you'll find is there's no single record that has enough info. But if you knew in, inside of Entity E1 that records 1, 2, 6, and 8, and you knew all the phones, all of the uh, emails, dates of birth, um, all combined into that one persona, you can match record 10 in there. If you can't do this, you can't catch clever bad people, because clever bad people never use the same name, address, phone, and passport on every record. Only the idiots do that. We call this entity-centric learning. Now, what if you delete a record, like for GDPR, right to be forgotten? You have to unlearn earlier assertions. So in real time, you have to be able to um, uh, pop it out. So if you delete eight, six pops out, and you become uncertain of 10, and that pops out as well. OK, quick demo, live demo. This is a little desktop app. Uh, that calls the API. It's all running on my laptop here. What we've done is we've loaded, I've loaded three, uh, three different files of restaurants. And I was over here. When I loaded these, I just clicked Add Data Source, and I clicked one of these three Singapore restaurant files. This is real data. Uh, we have a partner that lets us demonstrate this. And it says there's, it, I'd already ingested it. Oh, let me just show you what's in the file real quick. Um, the name of the organization, a full address, a phone, the cuisine, a geo. And if you clicked right here, if it was not already loaded, you could, I could pick a different field. There's a long list of things to choose from about what kind of column that is. And then I just clicked, I clicked load right here. It runs about 150 transactions per second. And it says there's 93 duplicates it's share about. There's 135 possible duplicates. It needs a little more information to be totally sure. And then these 4,100 are relationships, which in this case are going to be organizations that share the same phone uh, or share the same address. And so here's, these du here's the duplicates right there. What I'm going to do is compare them to file two. 
And it says there's 93 duplicates in file one, there's 358 duplicates in file two, and there's 4,100 duplicates in between. And let's just take a look at some of the matches. This is out of the box, no training, no tuning. On the phone numbers, between every dark line is a resolution. So these two records here are put together, these three records here. So sometimes both records don't have a phone. Notice they're structurally different. Look at the messiness of that address. Most humans, I mean, can miss that if they're even a little bit tired. And if we scroll down, let's just see, there's some Mandarin in there. Uh, call out a few things. Look at the difference in those names and those addresses. This address here doesn't even have a city or country. And I remember uh, one more of these just to show you, 72. Uh, right here. Look at the differences in those names and those different addresses. And if I'm right, one of them has no phone and the other two share a phone. So right out of the box, I did that. While I was on the Heathrow Express yesterday, uh, uh, heading over to town, I decided to go uh, download my Microsoft Outlook contacts to find all the duplicates in there. And I exported all of my Salesforce contacts. In under 10 minutes, I found out I had 15 duplicates in Microsoft Outlook. I have two duplicates in Salesforce.com, and I have 134 uh, records in between. I, I'm not going to search it because it's uh, real customer data. OK, uh, back to my charts, please. So these are all common use cases for where NAD resolution has a role to play. Um, my, my sensing company is not a startup. We're a reincarnation because this is technology that had already existed. Um, it's a team that we've been together building these systems for a couple of decades and 100 patents that we get to practice. Our big idea is just turning NAD resolution uh, into a function call for programmers, just taking that complicated task and making it easy. We came out of Stealth in June. We let people just download the software without even giving us an email address. Um, it's not SaaS, so all the data runs local on your laptop or cloud. Um, here's the website. The free version is 10,000 records, so if you're trying to help a nonprofit with duplicates in their marketing list, uh, you just click that free button, and then you get to run the app that I just showed you. Uh, we're really for programmers, though, and APIs. And so if you click that button, you get, get to our uh, API download. Here's our developer portal. Uh, we have a whole bunch of projects we support on uh, GitHub to help accelerate projects that use these. We have a white paper called Uniquely Sensing, which describes a really unique style of machine learning that we have, where it works on two records without any training data, and then it only gets smarter in real time as you're loading uh, more data. And what we've done is we've combined common sense. I was inspired by a Wired article that said AI needs common sense. And we use a layer of common sense, and then we use real-time learning. And the common sense keeps the real-time learning from going crazy. And as more data arrives, it makes it smarter, and, and then it changes its mind about the past. That's described in this paper. Uh, and with that, I'll just say thank you, and I answer every email. Thank you. <laughs>